Hristos a înviat, bun găsit, stimați telespectatori, la ediția de astăzi a emisiunii Biserica Astăzi, în care avem în mijlocul nostru, cu mare bucurie, pe Părintele Andrew Lauth. Părintele este născut în Anglia, este preot ortodox, aparține diocezei de Suroj, a Bisericii Ortodoxe Ruse din Anglia și Marea Britanie. A făcut studii de matematică la Universitățile din Oxford și Edinburgh, a predat la Oxford, este profesor emerit de studii patristice și bizantine la Universității din Durham. Un teolog bine cunoscut, un autor prolific, foarte multe din cărțile Sfinției sale au fost traduse în limba română și chiar în săptămânile ce urmează o ultima carte a, a sa va vedea lumina tiparului românesc. Vizita sa în țara noastră a fost uh, ocazionată de o conferință pe care o va susține la Universitatea din București, în cadrul facultății de filosofie. Profesor Lauf, Father Andrew, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Thank you for coming. We are so honored to have you here and thank you for, for accepting our invitation. I would first want to ask you a question regarding Orthodox identity. Mm -hmm. We as Orthodox Christians are citizens of this world as the Epistle to Diognetus would phrase it. Mm -hmm. So in consequence we are deeply anchored and rooted in the teachings of the fathers. But nevertheless, we must understand that the, their teachings and their advices and their messages were deeply uh, contextualized. How are we to translate their message for our lives and how are we to live the message of the fathers and uh, their legacy in the modern world? I think, really, that there needs to be a proper dialogue between orthodoxy and, the, and modernity, and, um, and not a one-way dialogue either. I mean, one way I think I put it is something like this, that, that one of the... Modernity has learned a lot. Um, it, it is a product of um, the um, really the scientific revolution that, that, that followed the Renaissance. Uh, we know um, well, television, we, we do all sorts of wonderful things, and lots of things have been learned. But alongside this, it seems to be a lot of things have been forgotten. Um, and that the, the main sort of point of contact, I think, between orthodoxy and the modern world um, is that orthodoxy hasn't forgotten. Um, and so, on the one hand, Well, we'll give you an example. I think one thing, for instance, that is, is, is bound up with modernity, as we know it, is, is that, that the progress of the sciences has meant lots and lots of separate disciplines that go very deeply, but don't, contact, don't make contact with one another sideways, because they are specialisms. And so we live in a sort of highly specialised world, and it's very difficult to get any sense of what it's all about. And this, I think, has led, in the modern world, in modernity, to movements like the New Age, various New Age movements, that, have, that feel a very deep longing for this sense of unity that used to be part of the way in which uh, we understood the world. It's been, it's been fragmented by the kind of advances that define modernity. Um, in some ways, I think orthodoxy could, is, 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 has a sense of these unities that have been lost. Um, but on the other hand, Um, orthodoxy is not very good. Mm -hmm. Orthodoxy takes advantage of modernity. Um, yeah, we, this is a Christian television station, orthodox television station. We take advantage of these things, yes. but we um, tend to sort of stand back from in our t tend, yes, tend to stand, stand, stand back as if oh, we just know more. We have a deeper understanding of things and leave it at that level. It seems that a dialogue needs to take place whereby enabling an understanding of the modern world to make some contact again with a sense of the world as created by God, as being a unity, um, where everything in, in some sense is held together um, by God's providence, and this, the sense that the world is created by love is also uh, focused in, in the cross and the resurrection of Christ. This is what we know and what we can continue to bear witness to. But on the other hand, I think we have to try and enter into the, the problems of the modern world itself, which are problems of um, disjunction, uh, problems of a kind of lack of meaning between areas where there is very deep meaning. Um, 
And this is a, a very long-term project. Um, and just another thing, I think also that, that, that this is not something that is, uh, that is that it's not something unparalleled. Um, uh, the, the, one of the reasons why I'm here is that my, my last book has been just translated into Romanian. And this is a, a, looking at two centuries of Orthodox theology from uh, the end of the 18th um, to um, right about now. And the, the Russian immigrants who came over after being expelled from uh, Russia as a result of the Bolshevik Revolution, many of them ending up in Paris, they had a very, felt I think in a way that they had come to a place characterized by fragmentation and um, lack of meaning, and that in some way they brought to this the world that had been fragmented, and there was some sort of, there was a, to some extent, primarily at a religious level, um, Orthodox talking to Catholics and Protestants, but there was some attempt to, to, to listen and to learn and also to be a resource. Um, and I think this needs to take place at a much, at a much broader level. On the other hand, we see that there are some discourses which use the the understanding of the, the worldview of the fathers mm. as being, uh, let's say, canonical, yeah. and uh, are trying to uh, put it put the discourse against the scientific discourse, and the understanding of the world that uh, which is being given to us by the sciences. So, were the fathers right when they they described the universe as they saw it? No, I feel, it seems to me that you can't justify that by going back to the fathers. The fathers themselves adopted the science of their own day. I mean, it, That's it a is a very interesting point. It, it is. It, you know, it, it, they thought the universe. They thought that the, the Earth was at the centre of the universe because the scientists of the day thought that. Um, they thought that health was concerned with um, a balance of the various temperance uh, of the various um, of, of the various temperance temperaments of the body. Um, because that was what the scientists felt. Um, the, the, the fathers use the science of their own day. There are points where they, where they are uneasy, particularly uh, when the science of their day was deterministic and suggested that human beings had no freedom. There, they, they spoke out very clearly. Um, but this was a debate going on within the pagan, within the scientific world of their own day. Um, and there, there, they had a very clear sense of where they stood. But they belonged to the debate that was going on in their own day. Now, to pretend that we can just simply take on board um, the the scientific view of the f- that the fathers adopted in their own day and pretend that we are supporting the fathers, that it just seems to me a complete muddle. Um, what we have to do, it seems to me, is to is to to rethink what we th- what we value in the fathers in relation to the world that we live in now. Um, and in some cases, once you start to think of it like that, it seems to me that there are various areas where there are, there are clear topics to discuss that um, there's the possibility of engagement. And one, for instance, example would be um, that one of, the, one of the things that defines modernity, as we know it now, are, are the, 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 the way of looking at the human person, the sense of... Um, uh, all, the, all the ideas associated with Freud, ideas of the unconscious, ideas um, of, 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 of the human as, um, as a mystery, um, but a, and a mystery that is, um, is expressed in terms of um, the various notions that, that psychologists use. Now, a lot of this um, is not new to the world of the fathers. The whole ascetic tradition of the, of the Byzantine uh, world, everything, the sort of thing gathered together in the Philokalia. This is, this in many ways, is a way of looking at the human that bears many, many similarities with um, with post-Freudian ideas. Um, and you could almost say that Freud takes the modern world back away from an over-rationalized understanding of what it is to be human, um, and takes it back in the direction of the fathers. And there have been a number of books and conferences and things that have attempted to, to explore what sort of parallels there might be between the language of Freudianism and depth psychology. 
and the language of the fathers. There are points of difference, certainly, but there are, there are very, very many points of similarity. Starting with the Illuminist project, Christianity ended up being in a situation very similar to early Christianity, as mm-hmm. being, for example, the representatives of the counter-cultural discourse. Yeah. And also Christianity had to face, especially after the Cultural Revolution, you know, the erosion of tradition, mm-hmm. the erosion of uh, authority, mm-hmm. and uh, various philosophical challenges, such as the critical theory mm-hmm. that ended up shaping even the way theology is being taught in, mm-hmm. in university. So, how are we to confess our faith as a counterculture? So, in this situation that we are being uh, labeled as irrelevant and even uh, backwarded. Well, I think it would help if we made a distinction between uh, elements of the faith that are genuine and uh, aspects of the patristic worldview that are just um, part of their world. Um, um, I take another topic, the idea of demons, and a lot of... Um, there almost been a resurgence in the notion of the notion of the demonic. Um, various spiritual fathers talk about the demonic in, in a... because um, it's a very real thing. And this may well be the case, but it seems to me that you can't say, well, the fathers believe in demons, therefore we must too, because everybody believes in demons in the fathers' day. Um, pagan... Neoplatonic philosophy has got an elaborate demonology. It was something common. It was something. It, it didn't. It didn't mark Christians out from anybody else. Nowadays, to believe in demons is to is to do something which maybe we want to do, but we need to see that we're doing it in a very different context. We're saying something that doesn't have resonances with um, non-Christians in the world in which we live. Whereas the language of demonology had lots of resonances in the fourth century with the. With, with non-Christians. And so we're doing something different if we say that there are reasons pre- for preserving a, 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 a discourse that includes demonology. And there might be good reasons for doing that. Um, and again, this question, the, the question of um, engagement between um, orthodoxy and um, modern um, psychoanalytical theory would be relevant there because... Um, modern psychological theory is very conscious of the fact that the way in which we behave um, has got some has got has got to do with far more than what we are aware of. That the reasons why we do things are not cannot be reduced to our conscious reasons for doing things, and that's part of the reason um, the justification talk about demons anyway. Demonology is supposing that one of the reasons why we do things is because we are tempted by invisible forces that we know very little about. There may be two ways of talking about the same kind of thing. Um, and um, in other respects, I mean, it seems to me that, that um, the collapse of the classical worldview of physics, the kind of Newtonian view of physics, which, which, which invests the external world with a, a sense of objectivity that modern scientists are retreating from, um, because um, our understanding of the, or both our, our understanding of, of, on the one hand, uh, what it is that constitutes the world has become more complex and also more um, evanescent, as it were. I mean, if the world consists of um, electrons and, and, and tiny subatomic particles, and this is what really is, then the world that we see um, is. How do you relate that to the world that that modern physicists talk talk about? That on the one hand, but the other, perhaps more important, more relevant factor is this: is this sense that we cannot observe the world as if we weren't in the world. That the, the, the whole sort of um, notion um, of the of the um, of the, the of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The most important aspect of that, it seems to me, is the, is the perception that we perceive the world within the world, not from outside the world. And that the idea that, 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 that the scientist, the observer, the experimenter is standing outside the world and looking at it and then sort of organising it is actually nonsense. We are in that world, we're part of it. And when we look, when we investigate, we are actually affecting the world that we are looking at and investigating. And this, I think, um, the, it introduces ideas into our understanding, even of knowledge of the natural world, that are familiar 
um, from the vocabulary of um, patristic theology, notions of the apophatic, the sense that there is, there is a mystery that we cannot exhaustively define but can only provide a, an outline of. Um, the sense that, that knowledge is ultimately to do with participation uh, and not just to do with um, constructing um, definitions. Uh, uh, definitions and models. These ideas are seen to me are, are places at which the um, both modern science and orthodoxy are wanting to say something about the, the, the passing of a way of thinking about the world that lay behind the, the tremendous advances of science but is now perceived to be inadequate. What about the accusation of patriarchalism? I mean, <clears throat> we somehow resonate with the fathers because yeah. we, uh, we, we have the starting point that mm. Christianity does not begin with us and yeah. for us yeah. uh, patristic identity mm -hmm. is, is relevant. Mm -hmm. But once again, their social models do not resemble our ones and one of the main critics are that uh, we are still uh, perpetuating models of patriarchalism and uh, such. Well, I think there's a lot of truth in that, and I think that it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, I think that um, the structures of the church are based on the structures of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire went a long time ago, but we still treat the world as if it was um, the Mediterranean world of the early centuries, early Christian centuries. And I think this, this, this has... Um, I think it has impact for all Orthodox Christians. But where where this, the, the shoe fits least well is where I come from, in the West. Yes. Um, the, what we call the diaspora. Um, and there, the ecclesiological models based on the, the early centuries make no sense. And, um, and I've yet to see any real recognition of this. Um, it's still I mean, in England, Well, let's just leave to England, which I know about. In England, there is a sense among many Christians that this is a passing phase, that we have these different jurisdictions, the Russians, the Greeks, the Romanians, and so on. But eventually, they will all settle down, and we will have um, British orthodoxy, um, one bishop in one city, also, all of that. But why? Uh, we're not part of the Roman Empire. This, this, is, this fits the Roman Empire, um, and I, I think that I think I would want to say that we need to rethink ecclesiology uh, by going back to the roots of ecclesiology um, rather than assuming that patterns that made sense um, then make sense now. And, and this involves also questions, as you say, questions of, um, of paternalism, of notions of understanding of authority. I mean, a lot of Orthodox discussion of authority never ask what authority is about. It's just how do you organize it? That is the wrong way of looking at authority. I mean, certainly the impression you get from the Gospels, from the Lord's teaching, is that an authority which is basically concerned with getting people to do things they don't want to do um, has got nothing much to do with the way in which our Lord taught. Yes. Uh, anyway, we will <clears throat> uh, discuss a little bit later, later about the Holy and Great Council of the, mm -hmm. the Orthodox Church, and maybe that's the first step um, mm -hmm towards uh, revising our yes. understanding of the, uh, the ecclesiology. Some of the most contested related the Christian categories are, are those of guilt and sin. Mm. And you have touched a little bit the, the problem of guilt and sin mm. when you, you started mentioning uh, Freud, uh, Freudian ideas. Mm. Uh, the opposing vision being uh, those of the Freud, Freudian and Marxist mm. discourse, you know political correctness, that uh, emphasizing self-fulfillment and subjectivity mm -hmm. uh, identifies in Christianity the, the main uh, opposing view uh, for keeping on to, to pass the ideas that sin exists mm -hmm. and guilt is real. Mm -hmm. So what is sin and what is the guilt from the... the Church Father's point of view and from your point of view? I think I want to shift that discourse sideways because I think it doesn't represent very well the vision of the Greek Fathers and the way the vision of the Greek Fathers received in the Church. Sin and guilt. Um, 
and seeing these as being you know, at the heart of Christianity. So Christianity comes to save you from feeling sinful, feeling guilty um, by, um, by forgiveness. Um, and so that, that's, not, that's not false. But it seems to me that the patristic vision, particularly the Greek patristic vision, it doesn't, that's only part of it. It's not the centre. Christ came to save us from death. Um, that's the primary thing. He came, to, he came to give us life. The, the, the icon of the anastasis, the, the resurrection that, that you know, we've seen so often in the, in the last, uh, last fortnight or so, is about Christ entering hell and saving us from the realm of death. And I would argue, in fact, I do argue in the little book, in my little book on introducing Orthodox theology that, that's been translated into Romanian, that the, the patristic vision really says that we are saved from death. And it's living in a world that is haunted by death that makes sin almost unavoidable. I mean, if you live in a world where it doesn't matter what you do because it's all going to be cancelled by death anyway, then, then what, in what way do you struggle against sin? It's all going to be wiped away anyway. Does it matter? It seems to me that in some ways that that what Christianity is more about, and certainly Orthodox Christianity is more about, is, is the sense that, that in Christ, death in some ways has been so challenged that it can no longer be regarded as, as it were, the horizon of human life. We're not just moving towards death. We're actually moving from life to life because Christ has overcome death. And that, I think, means that questions of sin and guilt are qualified. They're not taken away, but they are not the fundamental issues. And that, so that, that, that is, I think, the first thing I would want to say ab about that. I think you're right that, that, that in saying that in some ways many aspects of psychoanalysis come down to a kind of secularization of a Christian Western discourse about sin and guilt and trying to replace it with a discourse about um, self-esteem and self-acceptance, um, which seems to me to be just as superficial as the analysis that talks about sin and guilt. And that's a great point of view. Maybe the easiest way, the easiest way is to identify the changes that modernity brought upon Christianity is to look at the family. Mm -hmm the way the family is defined, the way of the family life is defined, the ethics of sexuality, sexuality itself, mm -hmm. it ended up being uh, defined as a social construct. In the light of these contestations, how are we to, to understand our faith? What is sexuality? Is it a social construct? There's no movement from some sort of notion of the family as a, as a um, large, um, organization that, 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 that uh, embraces not just a nuclear family, but relations. No. Um, there's no movement from this to a nuclear family, and as if that was you know, what really happened. Um, there have always been nuclear families. There have always been um, notions of family as being much bigger than that. Um, and the, 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 it's very easy to oversimplify the dialogue and say that we've, we've moved from one set to another. We, we haven't. We've maybe moved about within, between two polar opposites. The other thing that I about sexuality, um, I think before we start to talk about sexuality, I think we have to um, recognise that, that something has happened in a part of modernity that seems to me to be, again, unnecessary and needs to be examined. I think what, what has happened, and, it, and I think that, um, sexual, uh, that, that psychoanalysis owes a great deal to this, is that all human relations have been sexualized. It is now sort of taken for granted that any relationship between man and man, man and woman, woman and woman, has got a sexual dimension. Um, and that quickly um, mo moves into saying, well, um, uh, Christian ethics privilege is just one of these the man-woman relationship in a very specific way. And that the other sexual relationships are banned. Now, it seems to me that... I, the first thing I want to say is that, it, that, that this so oversimplifies 
the rich variety of human relationships that I think it's in danger of, of, of creating problems that isn't really there at all. Um, I'll give you an example. My, when I was growing up in England in the, in the early 50s, we had um, friends of the family um, who we called Aunt Rona and Aunt Kathleen. They were two sisters. They weren't related to us at all, uh, but we knew them from church. They lived together as two women, as many, many women did in, after two world wars. There weren't enough men to go around. Nobody said they're lesbians. Nobody looked at them in that way. They were just two women who lived together for, to make life bearable, really. Um, n nowadays, they would be, there would be pressure on them to come out and to declare themselves as a lesbian couple. But that is actually putting a pressure on them to do something which, that in those days nobody ever thought of doing. And that's what I mean by their relationship now. It looked at as a sexual relationship. In those days, it was looked at as a, just a way of living. Um, and it seems to me sex, sex does um, affect human relationships in lots and lots of different ways. But again, I want to say, look, there are lots and lots of different ways in which sex manifests itself. And it's not necessarily genital for a start. And the, 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 to, try and, tr to try and narrow it all down so that all sexual relationships are in principle genital and that um, and, and this is what, what we're really talking about seems to me to, to, to um, I think it, 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 it reduces the, 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 the variety of human experience and, and, and it is beginning to categorise it in ways that some are good, some are bad. I mean, even if you say they're all good, you're categorising them. Um, and it, I, that seems, that, that's the first thing that I would want to say, that, that, that I, need, I want to think through this before I started to think through um, what am I going to say about two men who find they want to live together. Um, um, I don't know the answer to it, but I don't think it should be ruled out on the grounds that it is a forbidden sexual relationship. Um, and quite a lot of marriages, anyway. Um, the way in which sex manifests itself in those relationships can be quite destructive. And I don't think we, we should idealise uh, what we think of as Christian marriage, as if it was you know, always a good thing. Um, it's, sex is something that, that affects relationships and in lots and lots of different ways. And I don't think we should categorise it in this rather crude way. Um, now, my objection to sort of national homosexual marriage is not objecting two men living together. But why do you want to think of it as marriage? Why do you want to see it as a kind of simulacrum of what a man and a woman do together, as, as the basis of a family? Why, 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 do you, why do you want to sort of make everything um, based on a model which I think is not necessarily appropriate? I will give you an example. For example, in Romania, uh, the average age that young women and men are getting married is mm. 27 for the women and 30 for the, for the men. Yeah. I mean, you are a father and pastor of souls. Uh, can you advise chastity up to this age? Or what kind of advice would you, would you give to young people? I'm not very good. I don't like giving advice. Um, and um, f mostly because I think that if you like, spiritual care, spiritual caring, is not so much concerned with directing people, it's more helping them to understand what they're doing. Um, so what I say to them, I mean, it, it happens not infrequently that a young couple who are not ready to get married because um, they're studying or whatever, um, and, um, and certainly not ready to have a family, I not infrequently asked, um, can we live together, can we have sexual relationships? And my line is to, to get them to think what this would involve. That sexual relationships are not just, um, it's not just sex. You'll quickly find that it's a matter of bonding, a matter, it, 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 it involves experiences of love and care. And you need to be aware of the way in which you are, the way in which you are opening yourself to a very much deeper relationship than you may be bargaining for, and that the consequences of breaking that can be traumatic. So I wouldn't tell them to do anything. 
I would say to them, look, the, you're dealing with an area of human behaviour uh, where we know, we know quite a lot about the consequences of our behaviour. And you need to think about that first. Um, and need to think about you know, why you want sex. I mean, it seems to me that it's understandable for a woman to want a girl, to want to allow sex, because she doesn't want to lose her man. But, but if you're thinking like that, doesn't that mean that you are afraid you will? And doesn't that mean that there are questions that you need to ask about how, what are you prepared to do to keep a man? Is that really what you're thinking about? Um, things like that. And um, um, and I justify what I the way I you know, taking this line is a story which I think is I'm pretty certain is true. I know if I hear so never to do. But Meshwani um, Bloom, great um, spiritual leader, who was the, the founder of the diocese of Suraj, he just said that once a young woman went to him who was having an affair, and she confessed to this affair, and Meshwani talked to her for a bit about various things, and then she said, "But are you going to tell me to stop?" He said, no. Um, no, that's up to you. You make that decision. I'm not going to make it for you. And I think that, that spiritual... I don't, I don't like the word spiritual guidance. Um, partly because it does suggest that the spiritual father is, is telling somebody what to do. Whereas I think that the job of spiritual care, if you like, is helping people to be genuinely free. So that they freely make decisions that they are able to live with rather than infantilizing them as do, does actually mean does very easily happen so that the people feel that they can't do anything without consulting their spiritual father that seems to me to be, it can become pathological it can become pathological yes within a few weeks the holy and great council synod mm-hmm. of the orthodox church will gather in, in crete What are your expectations from this historical event? Uh, what does it represent for orthodoxy? I'm not quite sure whether how honest I want to be, because um, if we all decry it before it starts, then it'll never get anywhere. Uh, but I'm very worried about some of the, um, um, the ways in which it's been prepared. It's meant to be a pan-orthodox synod of the orthodox churches, But there's been very, very little attempt made to involve all the Orthodox churches in the preparatory material. It's largely come from the Ecumenical Patriarch. It's all very well the Ecumenical Patriarch calling it. That seems to be a good and admirable thing. But the preparatory stages shouldn't be owned by him. Um, they, should be, they should be much broader than that. And there's been little evidence to suggest that this, this broadness is there. There's been very little evidence as to... Um, any consultation as to what the main issues are. Um, and, uh, and anyway, and, and, and two other things. One is that the where we're going to reach decisions seems to me to be completely unparalleled and um, against fundamental principles of orthodox ecclesiology. They will vote as patriarchates. The patriarchate of Moscow will have one vote. The patriarchate of Romania will have one vote. Serbia, etc. You can see why they want to do this, but um, and also they need unanimity, but that's not new. But the councils of the church, not just ecumenical council in the first millennium, every bishop had his own vote because the bishop ecclesiologically is, as it were, the, the, the foundational element in, 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 the, in, the, in the worldwide church. This is being over, overridden by a patriarchal principle which I think is no more than a convenience in orthodoxy. It certainly hasn't got that sort of ecclesiological significance. And it, it has actually a very good chance of frustrating the whole business. Only one patriarchate has to say no, and nothing has happened. Nothing. It is a recipe for very little happening that isn't so obvious that it doesn't need doing. Um, the, but the other thing is, is, is that because of the, um, the lack of consultation, um, We've got a kind of rag bag of topics and no time. How does it last for? 11 days is it going to last for? Um, I mean, the Vatican Council, well, it's a bigger church, but nonetheless, the Vatican Council took years, gave years to it. Um, and we're, we're doing something, we're having a, a, the first synod for more than a millennium. And we think Why so late? 
because the because the mechanisms for causing a council in the in the in the Byzantine world um, uh, began to fragment after the eighth century. Um, the Byzantine Empire, and the, the Emperor of Rome, the Roman Empire, the Emperor of the Romans, no longer um, um, had political authority over the whole of the Christian world. I and mean, he had no say in Italy or France. Or, you know. And so all he could have done, and all he ever did do, was in fact to call um, synods of the Constantinopolitan Church and friends. Um, so an ecumenical council in the traditional way could, could barely took place. The seventh ecumenical council barely took place. Um, and there was a lot of reaction in the West as to know who is this emperor, this emperor of the Greeks calling a council of the whole church. It was largely a Greek council. Um, and I think the only Western representative there were the, the papal legates. So the whole thing was, was the whole traditional way of looking at it had collapsed. That's, that is essentially the reason. Did any ecumenical council thought of itself as being ecumenical? Or did the label ecumenical uh, was being ran, granted after, afterwards? What, mm. Actually, what is the theological understanding of an ecumenical council? An ecumenical council is a council that represents the whole church and um, speaks with um, authority on fundamental issues. Um, um, what makes it ecumenical council? In practice, though, um, this is self-defeating. The, 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 a council is made ecumenical by being recognised by the next ecumenical council, which means, of course, none of them are ecumenical because if if nobody recognised the seventh ecumenical council, then it hadn't got authority to recognise anything else. You go back, and nothing is there. Um, nobody takes that line, and rightly, I mean, it's not meant to be so frustrating. There is another argument brought forward by an encyclical, I think, in 1848, mm -hmm. of uh, Orthodox bishops saying that actually an ecumenical council is being recognized as such only if it's received by the, the Christian. Yes, um, but then, and, and that would, that is, so to speak, and that is, um, well, how do you assess that? Um, of course. Um, it's assessed by the next ecumenical council. But, um, no, I think, and I think that's, that's what the Orthodox work with, a sense of reception by the church as a whole, um, whatever you mean as a whole, what, not whatever you mean by as a whole. But this doesn't pretend to be an ecumenical council. This is a, this is a pan-Orthodox synod um, wanting and to lead to discussions that will um, reach clarity, may even, may even reach decisions on important matters. I have noticed a very important remark made by uh, the Patriarch of the Romanian Orthodox Church mm -hmm. that this uh, synod must not be regarded as an, let's say, eschatological event, mm -hmm. but we must meet every third, uh, three or five years, I mean, to start putting in practice the synodality of the Church. Yeah. I mean, the Church must gather to discuss the problems of modernity, actually. Mm -hmm. We have not uh, made uh, those steps that the, ca that the Catholics started yeah. uh, uh, in the 20th century, and we must address modernity, and this is a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And we should not phrase it in theological terms, like the Ecumenical Council, but yeah. nonetheless we must meet and discuss and even argue, but we must somehow represent orthodoxy. I think, I, I, in, in very general terms, I think that's right. That, that that there needs to be there need to be ways of articulating the synodality, or as the Russian was called, the subordinost of the church, um, and that this needs this is not a once for all business. This is something that needs to be a continuing business, and it should run right through the whole church, from from the local synods through um, regional synods, right through to something um, that in some way. Um, enables a discussion to take place that is taking place on a global level. Um, the we problem are is political. <laughs> we are still under the joy and the blessing of the Feast of the Resurrection. Mm -hmm. And we as Christians are being called to give our testimony and uh, confession in this belief of the Resurrection and in the Kingdom of God that has been brought in the world mm. through the resurrections. 
Father Andrew, how can we do that? I don't think any new way of doing that. Uh, we do this um, by celebrating the resurrection in the Divine Liturgy. Um, because it's through the divine... The, the resurrection is not something we do. It's something that we receive. It's something that we are caught up in. And the divine liturgy um, preeminently sort of s- s- presents it in that way. Um, we proclaim the kingdom at the beginning of the liturgy. We, throughout the liturgy, we constantly recall the kingdom that we are going to be remembered in and participate in. Um, so that's at one level. But the other level, I think, that we need to be clear about is that, is that, the, that the kingdom will be, better way to put it this way around, the kingdom can be frustrated by the way that we behave. That, that if the liturgy after the liturgy contradicts the liturgy of the liturgy, uh, then the kingdom is not going to come, because we will stop it. We will frustrate it. Um, and God is not going to force us into the kingdom. It's not a kingdom ruled by a sword. It's a kingdom ruled by, by one hanging on a cross. And... Um, so there needs to be alongside this a real commitment on the part of Christians themselves um, to an asceticism that enables us to remain free and open in the world in which we live and this is a bigger problem maybe maybe it is now a bigger problem than it has been in the past in that the extent to which we live in societies that are organised on principles, that are completely, flatly, completely opposed to the gospel, the more difficult it is um, for us to make even a little attempt to live according to the gospel. I mean, a, a society which is consumerist, a society which thinks in terms of esteem and value in, in, the, in the way that the, the, the world that we know so, so clearly does, is a world that is, is opposed to the world that the Lord talks about in the parables. And to get from living in this world to living in this world as followers of Christ requires a genuine ascetic struggle on our part. Now, we know a lot about ascetic struggle. The fathers have told us lots about it. The Philokalia is a great collection of works on this. Um, But asceticism only works if we put it into practice. It's not a theory. What about the re- resurgence of belief in Europe? A lot of sociologists of religion are speaking about the fact that the predictions of the secularization theory, mm. classical secularization mm. theory, never <clears throat> ended up being fulfilled. And uh, just look in America, look at America, I mean, one of the most modern countries. Mm. As, uh, and still some of the most uh, and still it is one of the most religious countries as well yeah. of course a lot of diversity there but still religious yeah. and uh, also Europe is being now you know uh, provoked by Islam and uh, neo-pagans in the north is God back? I think we need to look very carefully at what it is we're looking at I mean, America never fitted the secularization model. No, yes. Um, I mean, there's never been any decline in church attendance in America in the way that the secularization model is. The reason for that, I think, is very obvious, because actually um, religion in America is not a matter of state structures. There is no state church. Nothing like that at all. Yes, yes, yes. Um, But if you look more deeply, um, perhaps actually another secularization model is working, because though you have a lot of church going... How far do people's decisions reflect their grasp of the gospel? How far does their way of life um, reflect the demands of the gospel? I don't think going church going has necessarily got very much to do with that. And then you've come to you, you, you partly answered your question as to Europe that um, I don't think it's the full answer. I mean, you weren't giving a full answer, but the fear of Islam. Uh, the fear of um, movements that undermined a vague sense of Christian identity, um, these will in fact stimulate ways of affirming Christian identity, but through fear. And that seems to me to be a very, very fragile basis on which to base a religious revival. Um, And also it could be very destructive. 
I mean, if we, if we form ourselves into Christian bodies because we're afraid of something, um, then the consequences are not likely to be universally benign. Um, I mean, the one thing that historically that has affected Christian communities, if they are afraid, is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is the fundamental reason behind anti-Semitism, it seems to me, is that, that Jews will not fit in a Christian society. Um, and you experience this in Romania in the 30s. We experienced it in a theoretical way in, in England in the 30s too, when people were talking about building a Christian society. And one of the dangers of this, there were some very frightening anti-Semitic statements made um, in, the, in England in the 20s and 30s. Um, and why? Because the notion of this notion of Christian society was based on fear, based on a kind of putting up, putting up the ramparts against the other that was um, dangerous. And it, it is, it's not a direct causal event, but it's not at all surprising that the decade after that understanding of a Christian identity led to the Holocaust. And they, they're not causally related, but they, they, they are related altogether too uncomfortably. Father Andrew, thank you for your in, illuminating insights on, on and advices and uh, view on how we should uh, live and uh, uh, live our lives, lives according to the teachings of the fathers. And we, once again, we thank you for accepting to be here. Mm. Thank you very much, Fribourg. Stimați telespectatori, emisiunea noastră se încheie aici. Până la proxima ediție a emisiunii, vă dorim o săptămână plină de pace și bucurii duhovnicești. Hristos a înviat!